I think we're ready to get started. First of all, thank you so much for coming to the Title Echoes launch event. My name is Aparna Dilip Nageshwaran Palmer, and I am the Chancellor of the University of Alaska Southeast. I am so thrilled that you can be here with us this evening to honor the amazing literary and artistic voices we have in Southeast Alaska. I got to say, um, this is why I am a chancellor. This is why I am in academia. It's because I love celebrating the accomplishments, the work, and the successes of students. And I couldn't be more proud of our students today. This is the 21st year of production for Title Echoes, but as you probably know, it is my first Title Echoes launch since becoming Chancellor of UAS. This regional journal is edited by undergraduate students and is part of our undergraduate experience at UAS. This is one of the most valuable experiences that students can have working outside of the classroom environment to apply their skills to something real, something that they can share with the rest of the world. Students are mentored by Professor Emily Wall by taking a series of creative writing workshops and then an internship class where they can learn to edit a journal as they produce this beautiful um, piece of art. Not only do our undergraduates play an instrumental role in this journal, it is truly a community effort. Thank you to all of the faculty and staff who have worked so hard on this year's journal. Thank you also to our contributors. I am so amazed by the writing and the visual art that is in this journal. Thank you also and especially to Professor Emily Wall. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. Now, it is my honor to introduce your MCs for the evening. Sienna Chuback is an English major with an emphasis in creative writing. She's originally from Salt Lake City, Utah, and moved to Juneau four years ago to attend the University of Alaska Southeast. She was published in the 2022 edition of Title Echoes before beginning as a student editor. She was the junior editor for the 2023 edition and is excited to be working as the senior editor for the 2024 edition. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce to you Sophia Gim. Sophia Gim is a sophomore at UAS this year and is majoring in English with an emphasis in creative writing. Sophia has always been a lover of anything creative, especially writing. She hopes to use what she learns during her time here for a future screenwriting career. Her artwork was published in the 2023 edition of Title Echoes, and her essay was also published in the UAS Academic Journal Summit. Sophia is so proud to be a part of the amazing work submitted by our students in this edition of Title Echoes. Please give her a round of applause. Before I turn it over uh, to them, I have one last thought. Um, as an undergraduate, I had two majors. Um, I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences and a Bachelor of Arts in English. So this is really close to my heart. And I have to say to you that um, my English degree has been as useful, if not more useful, than my science degree in my success in my career. 
Yes, I went on to become a professional scientist, but the ability to communicate crosses disciplines. The ability to be creative crosses disciplines. The ability to analyze crosses disciplines. And these are three skills that you learn as an English major that I treasure and use every single day of my life. So I'm extra, extra proud of this journal and of our students. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, we work and reside on the unceded territories of the Akwan, Tanta Kwan, and Shitka Kwan on Klinkit Ani, also known as Juno Ketchikan in Sitka, Alaska, adjacent to the ancestral home of the Hadas and Simpsons people. Uh, I'm Sienna Chivak, the senior editor this year, and as was mentioned, my journey started in 2022 when my work was published, and then 2023 when I was the junior editor. And sadly, this is my final year as senior editor. I'm originally from Salt Lake. I moved to Juneau four years ago and originally started as a marine biology student, super excited to see the ocean, and <laughs> just wanted to learn everything about it. Um, and it was just at my second semester that I took a creative writing class with Emily Wall. And then the next semester I took two. <laughs> and then the next I took three. <laughs> And now I'm a fully transferred English major and I realize this is all I want to do. Um, one of my favorite parts of this internship and especially as senior editor has been working with Elise, our featured artist, um, to decide on this amazing cover art. Uh, yeah, which Elise just did an outstanding job. I remember she sent me a document of about 10 images and just asked, you know, what, what I thought. And I saw this one, Medusa, and it was instantly like, that's our cover. Um, so I'm so glad that Elise agreed because the woman underwater with the kelp, it just seemed to be such a unique image to capture this Southeast Alaska experience. So I'm so happy that we now get to share this whole semester's work with you tonight. Sophia. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sophia Gim, and as uh, Chancellor Partner mentioned, I'm a sophomore English major with an emphasis in creative writing here at UAS. Um, I am the fall intern for this edition of Tidal Echoes. Um, I am beyond excited to be here tonight and to see the physical version come to life. Um, I'm grateful to say that I was featured in last year's edition as well um, with two of my drawings. And after coming to last year's launch, I knew immediately I had to participate in this in some way. So I am grateful to say it's come true now. Um, and uh, I had such a wonderful time learning about the process behind this journal, the manuscript, and being a part of something that promotes creativity and showcases writers and artists. Um, I am an aspiring writer myself, and I've always loved making art. Um, my favorite moments from the fall are definitely my interviews with Elise and Misty. Um, asking them questions were truly inspirational to my um, own creative process, and I will always remember their impactful words. And I am so happy to have had this opportunity and to be here with you all. Thank you so much for supporting Title Legos. And I'll turn it back to Sienna. Okay, so now I would like to announce our dedication, which Title Echoes would like to dedicate this year's journal to Karen Denise Silkaitis. Their support of UAS students is absolutely incredible. They're a dean who really listens to their students and works in 10 directions at once to support them in their dreams. We are so grateful to have their leadership at UAS and they are watching on live stream tonight. So if we could just give Karen a round of applause for everything they have done. And then now I would like to introduce our first reader, um, and this is Sammy Zelli, who is our Mac Barron's Prize winner. Uh, so Sammy is a junior undergrad undergraduate student studying English and Environmental Studies at the University of Alaska Southeast, whose primary interest lies in the relationship and intersections between language, culture, and ecology. 
She has other work published in the 2022 and 2023 editions of Tidal Echoes. She enjoys reading various genres of literature, crocheting and knitting, brewing pour over coffee, and the unmistakable summer song of the hermit thrush. Originally from Boise, Idaho, she is a grateful guest to the indigenous stewards of Clinket Ani, who have made possible her scholarly, personal, and spiritual pursuits in Juno's awe-inspiring landscape. She plans to remain in Southeast Alaska indefinitely to reciprocate meaningfully to her community and share the responsibility of communal stewardship and ecological and social activism. Sammy. prepared a nice and uh, cheesy speech. So. <laughs> to me, the poetry process is like spring thaw in Juno. The first draft is the first day above freezing, and every revision is a freeze-thaw cycle. A poem may lie dormant for a while, or just when you think spring has arrived, and just when you think it's done, it snows on a Monday. <laughs> something in us, something that's been hibernating, opens its sleepy eyes like a thawing wood frog. In this poem, that's something for me was the first love experience of a queer teen in Idaho who fell in love with a Mormon girl. The experience of being assured that, I w that who I was and who I loved were just a phase, being warned that queerness was a one-way ticket to eternal damnation. <laughs> to love a Latter-day Saint went through several revisions over more than a year, um, and I express my gratitude to Emily Wall's advanced creative writing class where this poem first tasted spring. To love a Latter-day Saint. Her skin reminds me of quarter peaches, small hairs blanketing sweet fruit, plump. Her face, a meadow of taupe angel kisses. You look like sisters. Bulging blue irises, eyelashes caught in glasses too close to her face. Her hair is sewed in strawberry, mine drenched in dishwater. Her left tusk hangs lower than the right, snowberry lips don't snag. Best friends, Friends, just friends, the only option in this God or Satan town, friends. I resent her jeans for hugging her thighs. It's just a phase. She dances with a Mormon buck, floor length colorless dress, hides her ankles. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to next introduce our next speaker, um, which is A.J. Schultz. Um, he has lived in Alaska for 10 years, growing up in Anchorage and studying in Juneau. Uh, majoring in English, Schultz hopes to build a career in creative writing, be it through prose, poetry, film, music, or anything in between. Schultz's writing draws from the experiences of coming of age as Gen Z in Alaska, as well as personal experiences of faith, fear, and identity. So I'd like to welcome A.J. to come read. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, y'all. Um, this first off, Sophia is one of my best friends, and the work that she has done for this journal, she has put so much blood, sweat, tears, and effort, and time, and love into this, and it really shows. And so, if we could just give her another round of applause. <laughs> um, I wrote this piece as part of one of. I wrote it last fall uh, as part of Emily Wall's creative writing workshop called "Writing the Sacred," and. The assignment was to write in a place that you found sacred that you would return to several times over the course of the semester and then produce a polished piece by the end. And for my space, I chose this bench on the trail up to student housing, <laughs> which uh, is frequented by a lot of us. And so this is called the bench at the end of the world. A canopy of angel hair hangs from towers of earth over a constellation of boat light shining through a, sh through a chain link fence in the bramble. Under flickering violet street light, rush hour hisses over November snow, drowning strokes of sailor's blade under halibut scales. Something in the noise says, I hope they get home safe. Sonder as diamond gaps in the fence frame a trillion, a trillion gallons per studded tire, a thousand spruce per deadline chased by twilight red bulls. 421 coffee lids per million goals on the harbor and counting. 
Wood planks soak in my leftover hemp smoke backwash, fingers burn, inhale heat and let me melt. Its rain-soaked body absorbs hot and heavy breath, droplets of forgotten words erased by head fog. A homesick freshman, a lovesick vagabond, a homesick elder, drunken dropouts, doomed situationships, former future roommates. I was with a boy here in the last night before he skipped town. He stalled for time. I hope he gets home safe. It waits on jagged earth off a wet trail before the summit of a hill called home, holding wanderers, burnouts, prodigies, boy geniuses, first generation students, children of first generation immigrants, lipstick on the rim of an Alaskan amber. Wait here long enough, company will find you. It's never alone for long. Take out one AirPod in case they recognize you. I'll find it here tomorrow in the same place I left it. No, days here aren't held by a deadbeat sun. I decide my dusk and dawn. Chapters start and will end here. Credits roll behind the moon, sorting the dialogues I remember, the chaos I call character, plot, conflict. I name the days after their sharpest memories, ignoring those worth ignoring. Andromeda's in no rush to meet me here. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, Aurelia Kessler, lives in Juneau with her family. Her work has appeared in a variety of publications, including Tidal Echoes, Wild Heart Magazine, Sir Crab Fat Magazine, Glass, A Journal of Poetry, and Creative Nonfiction. So the poem I'm going to read tonight um, came from a kind of unexpected place for me. I was watching a documentary a few years ago called One Strange Rock, and they talked about these tiny things called diatoms. And um, these, these diatoms generate up to 50% of the oxygen produced on the planet each year. And I just got fascinated and kind of fell down a research rabbit hole, and I wound up writing this poem. Consider the diatom. Magnified it swells into finely sculptured glass, two halves that fit together to make a whole, invisible in its life-giving death. A million deaths slowly sink through the ocean column, scatter across the seabed, where they will be compressed over centuries into sedimentary rock, where one day they will form the sand of an ancient seabed turned desert, and storm winds will carry this dust of glass across oceans, and they will drift down from the sky to fertilize a forest. Consider the diatom and its tiny beauty, phytoplanktonic adrift, its silicious envelope that beams with glassy iridescence, its microscopic fellowship. Consider how it blooms and how that changes the world one conversion at a time. Thank you. Okay. Um, so <laughs> next, I would like to introduce um, Linda Buckley for our next reader. Uh, Linda Buckley has lived and loved Southeast Alaska for over five decades. She tries to capture the beauty in words and photographs. Welcome her up to the stage to read. All right. So. <laughs> um. I have a place in Tanneke Springs, and um, Zool Bailey does, uh, we have a festival there, a music festival, and so Zool Bailey came and decided to play Shostakovich solo, all movements, and he said, usually I'm backed up by an entire symphony. Next week I will be in Greece playing with the Athens Symphony. So it was a little intimidating because it was a little tiny community center with 30 people, but it turned out there were people standing outside and they said he was in fact backed up by a symphony. Shostakovich. Last night, the sounds of nature mingled with a cello concerto. Slick silver skin seals flecked with salt barked on the reef. A lone humpback let out a low moan as she slid past town. Hummingbird wings added short staccato in the third movement. Raven wings beat the air like a timpani drum. And as the last movement came to a dramatic final stroke of the bow, a wedge of swans in perfect formation glided past. High above, a sedge of cranes winged into the western sky. Okay, 
I'm now going to introduce our featured artist, Elise. Um, so besides her family and friends, Elise Tomlinson has three great loves in life, books and the libraries that house them, being in nature and creating art. She moved from Nebraska to Alaska right out of high school in 1988 and earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Her first desk job was at the UAA Constium Library, <laughs> my bad, um, where she started as a student worker shelving books. She moved to Hawaii to earn her Master's of Science in Library and Information Science and was hired as a library facility member at UAS after she graduated in 1999. She also earned a Master's degree in Public Administration from UAS and is currently the UAS Library Dean. She has been a painter since childhood and has exhibited throughout Alaska, including multiple solo shows at the Juno Arts and Humanities Council Gallery, the Juno Douglas City Museum, and at Annie Kale's Fine Art and Crafts Gallery in Juneau, and at the Kimura Gallery and the International Gallery of Contemporary Art in Anchorage. She has sold paintings and prints to collectors around the country and overseas through her website, elisetomlinson.com, and has given workshops on online marketing for artists. Her work has been published on numerous book covers and in a variety of publications, including 18 pieces in previous editions of Tidal Echoes. She plans to host an exhibit of new work at her downtown painting studio, Stu Suite 5, for October's first Friday. She considers being selected as Tidal Echo's featured artist, one of the absolute highlights of her life as an artist, librarian, and bookworm thus far. She is grateful to live and work on unseated Klinket Ani. Thank you. Uh, working with Sienna and Sophia, uh, Sophie has been like the best part of being the featured artist. It's been just an amazing experience. The students at UAS are incredible, and um, I'm just so thankful to be here tonight as the featured artist, so thank you guys so much. Um, I had way too many slides, like seriously a crazy number, so <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed, so I'm going to be going through them really fast. I'm probably talking too fast because I'm also nervous, so just like bear with me. I'm gonna start with just a few examples of, I'm basically just showing work from when I have been in Juno, and so that is like the last um, 25 years. And actually, I'm gonna go back a second here. So when I first started painting in Juno, I was doing mostly these color um, compositions, and there was no really discernible background. And then over time, I started uh, taking photographs when I'd go out for hikes around this beautiful Southeast Alaska, and I would start incorporating. So this is like Brotherhood Bridge area, and just different, you'll kind of notice this is like from the wetlands, and um, what mountain is that, honey? Jum well, Jumbo, so this is from a photo where I was actually, I remember I was like laying on my stomach, like shooting up through the fireweed. I always try to get like an interesting perspective. Um, this is another one that's kind of shot from down up to kind of uh, do that foreshortening. And then this is from Eagle Crest. Um, I'm really interested in catching these little moments in time where the vibe is kind of like this is at the end of the day skiing when the sun's starting to go down, you're trying to get one last run in. So, um, or just how the fog goes through the trees and it, it's these, it makes these mystical little magical moments. And so I don't paint in nature because I'm trying to capture more a, a moment that will be gone very quickly. And so that's why I work primarily from photographs from myself and from my husband, Aaron Brakel, who's with me tonight. Thank you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> this one was taken from a photograph of a sailing race we did to Funter Bay, and that's Haiku, if anyone knows the little sailboats around town, and the um, lighthouse at um, Outer Point. And then I do some of these magical realism uh, compositions as well, and I do them in Photoshop, where I'll take the photos, uh, those will be like individual images of, of poppies, and then a figure image, and then a mountain image, and I kind of collage them all together in Photoshop, and then I take that image and I pr uh, paint it. I've been really getting into the underwater imagery lately, uh, with all the emphasis on um, kelp recently, and. There's so many different varieties. They're so beautiful. 
Um, I love how the light is brighter at the top and then it gets darker and how the colors change as you go underwater, the light spectrum changes. And then this is just a recent painting that I'm working on where I love to outline everything and so I'm trying to figure out, is there a way to outline clouds without it being weird? Um, it's actually harder than you'd think, so. Um, so this is one of, <laughs> this is a self-portrait that I did I think in high school and I thought it was great. Like at the time I was like, man, I nailed it. Um, but looking at it now, I see that the eyes are pretty flat and there's some weird stuff going on around the mouth. But um, <laughs> I, mentioned <laughs> I mentioned in my interview that I do a lot of um, scenes from movies because I'm a huge film buff. Um, this is from a movie called uh, um, Constantine, which was kind of a terrible movie, but uh, I love uh, Tilda Swinton and she was like magical. She was like uh, Archangel Gabriel or something. And so I did this painting of of her, and I'm starting, you can see I'm starting to get that depth a little better, but there was still like, it was still something about the eyes were a little flat. So there's this um, artist called Malcolm Lip Lipke, who I'm a big fan of, and his face is just so three-dimensional and luscious and beautiful. And I think it's really great for artists when they're starting out to just try to copy other artists and see if you can figure out what they did in order to get that look. And so this is a photo from my studio of my attempt at Pink Flower. And then here's kind of a close up and you can see I'm getting better with the light on the nose and the mouth and the, under the lids. And then there's his, so his is still better, but you know, I'm, I'm getting there closer. And when you compare it to, um, you know, the previous version, uh, it's much better. So now that I've done his, a copy of his, which I would never sell or anything, it's really just for learning, I wanted to do my own version, so I found a little black and white photo online, and then um, I flip it, because I always try to make the images I use look less like the image I use so that I don't infringe on anyone else's copyright. And so this was like an early version, and then I started putting color in. You can see the little black and white photo next to it there. And then I added like a, a nun's habit. And you can see where I'm putting that intense highlight on the nose and mouth and on the under, under of the eyes. And then there's the finished version of the painting. And so it's still like my piece, but I definitely um, learned a lot from where I was there. <laughs> So I just want to point out, like, people say, oh, I'm not an artist, I just draw stick figures, I don't have any talent, I could never do that. And the truth is, you could, because everyone starts doing stick figures. I started doing stick figures. And the truth is, you just have to practice. Like, an accountant doesn't wake up being an amazing accountant because they're talented, um, and nor does a pharmacist or a nurse or any other profession. Like, all the arts, you, you, it's not talent, it's hard, hard work. So just, if you have any interest at all, I just, Go for it. <laughs> so this is um, another photo I took out uh, hiking around. It's a um, devil's club, light shining down from it. That's the uh, one I used for this painting um, that Emily Wall used for her book, um, except this isn't the painting that she used for her book. This was. <laughs> this is a digital painting, and I had to do a digital painting because after the publisher accepted the image, um, I realized I didn't have a high resolution cop uh, version of it, and I didn't remember who I sold it to, and so I had to recreate the whole thing in order, in like two days or something, because the publisher had a deadline. So I did it in Procreate, which is a very cheap one-time purchase software that you can um, do, and it's an amazing um, program. You can, uh, with an iPad and a, a pen, that, and you can get refurbished ones for very cheap. You can do just amazing work online these days, and I'm happy to share how to do that with anyone who has an, an interest. Kune, how do you say Devil's Club in Tlingit? Sucked. 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 So, I, thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you're much better at Procreate than I am. Um, so here's Tilda Swinton again. I, uh, she's older now. She's a vampire in Only Lovers <laughs> Left Alive. I just love her. I don't know what it is, but I put her into like an Alaska scene here, and I wanted to use this example. If you look closely at her hair, 
Um, I get texture in my paintings by putting on very heavy, thick white paint and letting it dry. So at one point, this painting will just be all white with nothing but texture. And then afterwards, I go on with a, like a, a paint that has um, a transparency and just kind of put it on and wipe it off a little bit in order to get like that more rich textured look. And then this is just a, it doesn't look very, it looks weird in this slide, but <laughs> it's, um, I love playing with the cool and the warm colors. This is um, a portrait that I'm working on currently. And um, yeah, a little more about process. So someone asked me to do a commission of this photograph, and so I just wanted to show like there is a way to do sort of a more fairly one-to-one -one kind of interpretation of something. Um, back to that when there's a photograph that you take where you catch that light just right, where it's hitting those clouds and you get that moment, and then trying to recreate that in a painting. And um, this is uh, right behind the library. There's the painting I did from that. This was a really crummy photo I took on a sailboat going into Douglas Harbor. And, uh, but you can still get a pretty decent painting from a crummy photograph. So, <laughs> so back to uh, when I make my collage, collages in Photoshop. The Lupin photo is one that I took, again, kind of crouching down, trying to get an interesting angle on it. And then I take um, a figure that's cut out in Photoshop and you can move it around, you can make the figure bigger, smaller, change the color, flip it so it's facing the other direction, do all of these things. I have thousands of compositions that I've never painted because I didn't get it to that point where it felt just right to me. Um, but later I took this photo, and you'll note that there's still flowers on those uh, fireweed, but I thought the yellow looked more like a fall kind of scene. So I created this painting using that first figure, but I just flipped it in the other direction and then I put in fall uh, colored fireweed instead to kind of go with those colors a little better. This is another example where I took a figure that I found online. She's got a little fur coat at her feet and I um, wanted to have her sitting next to coffee because coffee is my love language. And so <laughs> I put the coffee in Photoshop next to her instead of the um, blanket and then I added that little frame to the window and then what's outside the window? Well, it could be that first kind of cool photo of the mountain or like maybe some misty trees or this was my actual uh, photograph from the bridge that I decided to go with and so here's what it looks like and then I flipped it again trying to like mix things up and that is the actual um, final painting or close to final painting and that is one that actually went in Tidal Echoes. So in my studio I usually take the, um, do a line drawing of the finished composition from Photoshop. And then if you can see off to the right, the faded image of the, um, it's because when it's daylight, it's hard to see the, uh, the projection, but I project the image onto another canvas so that I can see it big while I'm working on it, which is really cool. And then there's the finished painting. And that is like a bunch of different photo uh, flowers that were not together that I, put in the same frame and then the back view was a totally different uh, photograph as well of the forest and the little flowers. So this is my studio. This is my happiest place on earth <laughs> besides the library. Um, <laughs> I have to say that. No. Um, and I just, <laughs> I just wanted to do a couple shots from my studio. It's right above Shoefly downtown. It's a beautiful space. It gets excellent light. And I have my TV there where I watch all my horror movies and stuff while I'm eating junk food and painting. It's like super fun. And so, um, and I also have space on the walls to do, uh, like to display the work. And so I'm planning to do that um, for my first Friday in October. And then just if you don't have your own studio, I didn't have my own studio for most of my life. I painted in every kind of little space you can imagine. This is in a little cabin in Baranoff. And there's the painting I did. And this is uh, various little rooms and living rooms and other spaces that I've used as my studio. So you don't need a fancy room or a fancy space. Um, this is a little cabin in Petersburg. I always travel with some uh, paints so that I can paint wherever I go. So this is another image of like from the hangar looking towards Douglas. And I was like, oh, it's kind of boring. So I added a figure and then um, I kept painting it in and I was like, whoa, I think I went too far with the outlining. So I tried to back it up. I added some pink around the edges, so then I changed her hair to pink and then brown, then 
I totally did a completely different face, and now she looked too happy. I wanted her to look kind of sad and thoughtful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, oh, man, she looks too happy now. And then she looked kind of, I don't know, like maybe she had an upset stomach. <laughs> and then I just went back, and I repainted the original face that I had done before. So sometimes I take photos of everything because I often ruin what I've done by overworking it, and then I have to go back and paint it what I did before. So this was kind of the fi fi final version of that. And then here's um, another mountain. You'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner, there's like a green bush. So when I first painted this, and for a long time when I was painting, I always tried to do a fair, even if I was doing different colors and stuff, I always tried to make it look the same as the photo in terms of the composition. But I realized that green just looked weird there. And so I just painted it all pink in the foreground. And like, that's the beauty of being an artist. Like you are the creator of your, the, your surroundings. So you just like can do whatever you want. <laughs> And this is um, a painting by David Hockney, um, Felled Trees. This is, he's one of my favorite artists, and I um, sort of emulated him in a photo I did um, out the rainforest path with all the um, skunk cabbage. And so then I added in Photoshop this like hair blowing in the wind, painted that in, but then I wanted the color from the um, skunk cabbage to be on the figure, so I sort of painted that in, and that's kind of the finished version of that one. And then here's just another one from in that same out, um, rainforest trail, that kind of brown brackish water. And this one's Ophelia, she's kind of floating in it. But those are my little David Hockney trees in the back. So you can incorporate other people's kind of signature things into your work and still make it your own. I, I think so anyway. <laughs> and then this is a photo I believe Aaron took hiking and I added some flowers in and it was gonna be these uh, I think they turned into sort of lily pads on a river, but I never really liked this. So I went into pho Photoshop and I started making it more of a triangle shape and then I added a little uh, figure to it. So now she's, it's her dress. But this painting actually doesn't exist. It's just in Photoshop, but I might paint that someday if I get around to it. <laughs> and then I do variations on a theme. A woman bought this painting and she really wanted like a sister piece for it. So, oops, it's not there. Oh, that's okay. Um, I'll, oh, there's the sister piece. <laughs> so I'm not sure what happened there. But, um, and there's the two of them together. So kind of trying to do one figure forward, one back, and kind of playing around with color and stuff. I just like kind of, you know, doing, mixing and matching and stuff. Um, this is a woman swimming up through a kelp forest, um, and it's kind of a square format, and then this is more of a, a thinner format and it's the exact same figure but different colors and I kind of see her as like walking through sinew or something and so I try to just you know do little variations on a theme and then this is the Mount Roberts tram and these are just like you can see that tiny little dot there is the tram <laughs> I actually I painted it out because I realized after the fact I, it made me upset like I didn't want to actually see it in there and then whoops Oh, my fingers are, I think I'm, my hands are shaking because the, my slideshow is going kind of crazy. Um, but I wanted to pizzazz up the sky and I painted it this gold color and then I painted blue into the trees and the fog and I thought maybe that's too far and I might actually go back to, to that. I can't, what do you think? Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Undecided. <laughs> So here, here's another um, mountain that I love. You can see this mountain when you're driving into Juneau. Um, it's called Sha Tla. Tla. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, it's a moldy top, or moldy top or moldy mountain, and it has all this striation in it, which I think is really beautiful. And I started doing it in the summer, so all the colors were kind of green, and then it got to be autumn, and you know warmer light and the painting kept changing and changing and changing and then I don't know what I was thinking here but I was like yeah this looks amazing and then this is what it looks like now but basically I'll put paintings away for years and then pull them back out and say like this always bothered me and I just do something totally different so I never really know like until someone buys a painting like I'm just going to keep painting on it forever <laughs> So anyway, I really appreciate you all um, letting me share some of my process with you. Um, and uh, I'm willing to answer any questions that anyone might have. Um, yes? How 
How, how do I? How, how did that, like, how did that start? Because that, obviously that's something that is, is part of your work, is putting in a kind of ideal female figure. Well, I don't know if it's ideal. And in fact, I was really insulted once when someone said something like, why are all your females like young and beautiful and not like you? Don't, they don't look like you or something. And I was like, hey, now, <laughs> no need to get rude. Um, <laughs> I, you know, for, for a long time, I, I painted uh, women that were just different colors, like purple and red. And I didn't want them to be representative of any race or any, you know, ethnicity or age or anything. But I don't, I don't know, like, I just, the, the shapes of plants around Juno, um, I often try to emulate those shapes. There's a lot of curviness and a lot of, um, I just, like, it looks good to me, and that's the only thing I can really say is that that's what, um, I put all kinds of different things in uh, to the composition, and then at some point it just, whether I've been indoctrinated to think that looks good, it just, I'm like, oh, that looks good to me, and then I just paint that. So that's not a very satisfying answer, but <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> Renee? Um, so we have a microphone coming over okay. for those who have questions. So just wait for the mic so that those online can hear. And then if you are online, feel free to put a question in the chat. We've got a little chat box monitor. So. Uh, I really liked the one where the the trees look like little drops or something. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide whether it's going to be more realistic or more abstract? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I honestly, um, I wish I did know, but I've always had a very strong sense of, like, I cannot not, it's impossible for me to do a painting without outlining every single thing. And I don't know where that comes from, but I just have to do it. And so when I'm trying all these different variations, at some point, some variation of it feels like, okay, you're done now. And then I just, that's what, <laughs> so I, I don't know. Was the first tree a drop, or were they like regular trees, then one came out as a drop? And you're like, oh, let's do droppy trees. I think probably that is exactly what happened. Like at some point I did a droppy tree, and I was like, hey, <laughs> that's, that's kind of cool. I'm going to do all my trees as droppy trees. And then, a sh then like a pokey tree starts at some point, and then it's all pokey trees. So, <laughs> I, but you're right. Uh, I, I do think that sometimes I'll do something that might be a mistake. Um, I've done paintings where I hated the painting, but just one thing, like the droppy tree or whatever, and it was really cool, and then I just use that in the next not crummy painting that I do. So I think it's all just trial and error, but yeah. And are you working in acrylics or oils, and then how does that change once you switch over to digital? And then I'll give this to oh, someone. No. <laughs> I work in oils. Um, I tried to, I've tried numerous times to work in acrylics, and I'm just absolutely unable to do it. It's um, too fast. Things dry very fast. And how I work is generally I have like six or seven paintings or more going on at one time. So I do a, a, a layer, a layer, a layer, and then these are drying, layer, 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 and then I start back. So there's always pieces in different stages of drying. And um, with, it gives you a lot of time to blend everything because oil is very forgiving. It, it, it dries very slowly, and so you can keep just playing around. And then it, you still can paint over it. You just have to wait a while if you don't like it. So yeah, and then moving to digital, um, I've shown people paintings that I've done digitally, and they won't believe me that it's not like either a photograph or a painting or something. Like they don't understand how the technology has changed. You can do um, with an Apple Pencil the stroke, you know, uh, variation. I have paper-like on my laptop, so it feels like you're drawing on paper. It is really um, the experience of drawing or painting on a actual canvas or a piece of paper. But the beautiful thing is that when you make a mistake, you can just tap your finger and it magically goes away, and <laughs> you don't have to like spend a lot of time washing it out or trying to erase it. So um, it and then. Whereas I used to do a lot of work in Photoshop, primarily I do more of my pre-work in Procreate now. And I started playing around a little bit with AI, which, the devil. <laughs> 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 but 
but also exciting and fun and I'm all about it. So yeah, any other questions? <laughs> She's like, are you yelling at me? <laughs> so uh, you said you had a show in October. Yes. Is that if somebody wanted to purchase something, we have to wait till October, or is there a way to see what you have for sale right now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I used to post uh, photos online on Facebook and stuff when they were when they were done or even in process progress, and I quit doing that because. Um, I would do something to be really excited about it, and I'd post it, and I'd think like, oh, stand back and, and, and hear the applause, and then like crickets, and then I'd suddenly think this piece is a disaster, and I'd take it down, and I'd cry in my pillow, and you know, all the likes and all the pressure to be on social media and, and all of that just kind of became too much, and I felt like it was actually changing my work because I was trying to chase those hearts and likes and whatever, so I'm just like, no. Um, I, I do have an art, a website where you can buy art, but not everything's up there, and I have a whole new body of work that will be at the October show. And if someone's interested in seeing it before then, like um, this piece is available for sale, for example, and all the pieces that are in the journal are available, you can always contact me. So, good, good question. <laughs> Um, so, Prohost Havoc says, I've been following you since 1989. Has there been periods of time where you feel like you have grown exponentially as an artist, or has it um, been an even progression? Um, probably since the last uh, couple of months when I became the featured artist for Tidal Echoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolute exponential growth. Because uh, really, like, I would, you know, Every artist goes through a phase where you kind of feel like a failure and you're not really doing anything and and you're in this sort of latency period like a crop you know like the crop needs to rest for a while before you plant new seeds and and but sometimes if that goes on a little too long you start to really doubt yourself and it just takes one person kind of believing in you or you know to just get you back in the studio again get you painting and then you for, for, like why did I ever stop like this is the love of my life, you know, being like beside you, Aaron, honey, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so yeah, I feel like um, just recently, I am, I am like a machine. I am just cranking out so many new paintings in the last couple of months. It's, it's really exciting. So yeah. Oh. Yeah, I had a question about when you said you had to outline everything in your painting. I don't really know what that means, and if you can show me an example. Um, well, I, I, these are um, projected images, so maybe you can't see them as well, but every one of these trees is outlined. The mountain um, has all lines in it. Um, every single one of these trees has an outline. Uh, like, some of them you can see easily, some you'd have to look at a little, har a little more closely. Let me show, um, this is everything in this image has an outline. That's all outlined. <laughs> so basically just every, um, a lot of people are told to make soft transitions between like one field and another field. And I just go like almost doing comic book art, you know, like um, you could probably take a paintbrush tool and Photoshop and do a single color in any one of my shapes and it would fill solidly because everything is outlined. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it's just like a, um, um, a compulsive thing that I do. And, and I was gonna show like in this photo, for example, um, some, it's weird, like some of the, for some reason, some of these are, okay. What I'm seeing down here is different. Okay, um, this image, for example, Someone saw this and they were like, um, oh my God, I wanna buy that. It was just starting out. It was like I had only just started painting it. And then when they saw the finished piece, they didn't really like it anymore. So that's another <laughs> like reason to be, and like this looks like the photo where all the like green is on the, the window, but um, it seemed like too much green. And so I actually painted the green out. So even though the green was covering that window, I took it out. 
So there's just, um, but every one of those flowers is outlined, the windows are outlined, every stem of every gr blade of grass, every everything. So it just, gotta do it. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, wait. There are people raising their hand, but it's okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Anyone can ask me questions later. Um, I work in the library and I love talking about this stuff, so. <laughs> And just to add on to that, they will both be um, at the end waiting outside for questions, anything like that, so you guys can come talk to them at the end. Um, so next up, we have Misty St. Clair, um, and I'm here to introduce her. She's our featured writer this year. So Misty St. Clair is mostly a narrative poet who writes from a place of introspection, longing, and grief about family relationships and the more than human in our world. She's interested in telling the human story, threading her poems with science, weather, and non-human beings. She's working on finishing her first full collection. Emerging themes are raising young adults, family, the changing climate, and exploring her own adoption and cultural loss. She sees poetry as a way to seek meaning and understanding when life is full of complications within our own families and the world at large. We have a lot to grapple with in these ever-changing, fast-paced, and politically di divisive times. Writing is a way to explore the internal struggles and fears surrounding these big swamping topics. For her, it's an outlet to explore her feelings and thoughts. It's also a way to pay attention and see the good in the world, to be reassured by looking at the beautiful and hopeful things that have always existed and will continue to exist. She is the author of the chapbook, This Morning is Different, and has received a 2023 Individual Artist Award from the Rasmussen Foundation and a 2021 Alaska Literary Award from the Alaska Arts and Culture Foundation. She has poems in our forthcoming, oh, in or forthcoming, in the Alaska Quarterly Review, The Common, Northwest Review, SWWIM Every Day, and others. Currently, she lives with her family in ball-obsessed border collie in Lincoln Ani, where she hikes, writes, and wanders the mossy rainforest. Oh my God, what did I just do? <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> so <laughs> she is a 49 Writers Board member and an editor for the Alaska State <laughs> Legislator. Uh, she can be found at mistystinclair.com. Misty can come up here now. <laughs> um, Elise, you are a tough act to follow. <laughs> And everything that you said about your creative process, I feel like applies to me as a poet. So basically, you don't have to ask me any questions because you can just refer to Lily's. <laughs> um, this is so exciting. Um, and what can I say about your work, Elise? It was just so gorgeous. I love the colors that you bring into, um, into your pick paintings, especially because I feel like they're so centered in our <laughs> so centered in, in Juno, which just can feel so drab and gray so so often. Um, thank you to the Tidal Echoes, team, Tidal Echoes team this year for inviting me into your, um, your pages and into this space. Um, I know it's a lot of work to put this journal together and, and put this night together and um, it's a good work I hope and um, I'm excited to be here and also very nervous. Um, I will begin with poems that are about my father. Um, this summer will be two years since he passed um, he was an alcoholic, and um, he let go of his parental rights um, when I was nine years old. And my relationship with him after that was um, sporadic, and we had a very complicated relationship. Um, but writing about him um, and difficult topics is a way for me to explore and to understand things. So it's been really therapeutic. The first poem I'm going to write is actually not in the journal, um, but it's a good introduction. Uh, read, I mean. At the BIA office. I was in my 20s when my father took me to apply for my BIA card, my certificate of Indian blood, like he was reclaiming me. We spread out my library of identities, blood birth certificate, adoption papers, after birth certificate. All those old papers creased and yellowing 
an official sticker barely hanging on, proof once I was his. IDs, mine with a name that never really fit, and his with a name I had lost. I was nine when he signed papers surrendering his rights to me, and for years we barely knew each other. The forms ask, who is my father? Who are my ancestors? How much blood? And then later, I again proved my making when I received our tribal ID. It has a picture like a license, and I told myself it's a luggage tag with his name and address, returning me to him. Sometimes I get out those papers and rub my thumb over the ridges of an embossed seal. I have wanted to throw them all away. It's hard to remember what we needed to prove. How long I believed I was misplaced, lost between birth, rebirth, paperwork, and blood. Um, when my father was young, I think he was in his 20s, um, he hit and killed a raven while driving a car, probably drunk. Um, he talked about that a lot as some sort of curse. And the way he lived his life and the way he gave up on life, um, it was as if he was trying to trade places with the raven. Raven appropriates my father. Every spring, my father's birthday arrives, and he is surprised by his own pulse. The snow spreads across the valley, but the willows will soon blossom their soft fur before leafing. Thaw after thaw will free the river's pent power. All around, there is energy. For now, the cancer unbodied. But what is left? He is still full of dark matter. His whole life, he's shaped the land or made something from nothing, whistled and sworn by the hammer sounds, even nailed a few caskets for those who were good to him. He doesn't seem to know he's been searching for the end of darkness, only that he was claimed by the raven he killed 40 years ago. It's been waiting. He should follow. Um, when my father was dying, um, I spent um, several weeks with him, caring for him. Um, this was in Fairbanks, Alaska, where I grew up. It was summer, wildfire season, and then I came back to rain. And it felt particularly rainy and it's really natural, of course, to associate um, grief with rain. I'm not making any dramatic leaps here. Um, but my association or my relationship with rain has changed since. Rain, grief. Coming home to rain and salt, the earth exhaling moss and petrichor, ocean decay, warm shades of green, the sky opaque harmless as a moon jelly, the sky so white, the white not an absence, but a uniting of all, and the rain, the same rain that fell on ancestors, the same rain that fell on the ancients, falling on me now, after weeks spent inland, tasting forest fires, split wood and carbon, forgetting everything I knew of rain, my mouth waters. Whipping sheets of rain, unguttered roofs, beating brims of leaves, pooling depths of flowers kind of rain, rain at the ankles, unbearable, heavy-limbed, sweltering, scrubbing sand and grit from the hollows of the sky kind of rain, woolly, shaggy, bear hug rain easing into a mizzle, into rain you can't see, only feel, the sky a white raft floating down the mountains, the sky offering an oar. Nineteen days have passed, raining each one. 
Is this rowing, or does it only feel like rowing? The mountains raise a glass, nod in your direction. The sky reaches over, tucks in the edges, leaves strip days. Some flowers sag, wet wood smokes. A worm shakes the grass, the last wheeze between window panes. Time condenses, as in one month atomizes three, spreads six, sows a year. And still, you now, ash in the ground. This is as close as will ever be, mist on my skin, in my body now, a wild weed. Um, because I often dwell on relationships, that includes my poor children, who are now, and it's hard for me to believe, adults. Adultlings, I like to call them. Um, this next poem was written when one of them was really pushing my limits. And I was a little nostalgic for, um, for pregnancy, too, when they were contained. <laughs> Putting up fish. Rows of Yukon kings hung in strips over alder frames. A tin shack held the smoke so it drifted around the fish, which dripped a dark orange oil onto blackened soil. The run was thick as willows, and twice a day the men took the boat across the river and pulled in the nets. The women spent their days and nights gutting, stripping, and hanging the salmon. And I was full with you. I took the smaller fish while you flopped in my belly. And when I ate the strips, I felt the alder and ash, the oil and river pearl through us. When next spring I offered that gold instead of my breast, you gnawed and chewed the meat with your new teeth, sucking the fatty skin until your mouth stained an orange glow. That was 17 years ago, when I believed we were still one and that you would always want what I wanted, what little I knew. The first thing to hang were my expectations. <laughs> um, this next poem was inspired actually by a fresh air interview. Uh, at the time, one of my children was going through some turbulent changes and um, and some hard things, and I felt like we were both experiencing this impossible pain and that I had failed um, in my role as a protector. In utero, your eyelids opened and closed, light passing through me to you, illuminating that safe darkness, and you listened to the melody of my voice riding waves of air through the thick wrap of womb. My cadence traveling bone, skeleton conductor, vibrating the amniotic fluid reflecting against your body. You heard with your body, my love. I touched you before you knew heat, cold, pressure, pain. Um, the last few poems I'm going to read don't need a lot of introductions, so I will just, mostly I'll just read them. Let's say there are people left, and my bones are found by survivors of this pained land who have humps like camels for storing water. Will they dust me off and want to know who I was? Let's say humankind is still curious even if they are genetically perfected or merged with AI and robots, wearing bionic limbs and exoskeletons, or like the man who has an antenna implanted so that color waves vibrate in his skull and he can hear yellow, magenta, the green of sleeping grass, or the woman who has seismic sensors in her feet and feels earthquakes roll across the earth. Let's say a few mysteries stand Let's say I live to 100, then wander off a trail into the woods, lie down where I've always been and my ancestors have always been, 
Find a meadow or soft bog and rest in it. Sink into the earth and blink out like a star. It wouldn't be a bad way to go. The earth mouthing my flesh, the soil shifting and spitting out a stoic femur, an arched pelvis, lovely jaw, and placing them to the side of her infinite plate to be found. So I admit that I often dream of living somewhere else where it's warm, <laughs> what I, where they have what is real summer, where you can grow really good tomatoes. Um, so this next poem is about being somewhere else in summer. Summer and other places. In the morning, there is a fine mist, and the doves hoot like owls. On a walk, I find a tree with little black plums, juicy but not dripping, sweet enough to suck the flesh from the pit. Blackberries and flower in their labor toward fruit. As each day warms, my screen door pops open like magic. Someone gives me carrot blossom honey. I hang clothes to dry under the sun. Nothing else happens. I don't seem to exist. I am reminded of how earth still smells of my grandmother and her bees. And when I return to my own home, it is raining, or it is about to rain. The sweet dried grass scent on my skirts. I think of the naked sun and strawberries imprinting my fingers. Maybe it won't rain for days. Each morning now, I spread honey, dark and slow. Um, but Juno has become home. That's all I'll say about this next poem. <laughs> Becoming moss. <laughs> For so many years, I have lived in this rainforest, watching the rain become more rain, cattail moss hanging from branches like a carpet of coral, thrown over logs like blankets, if green could be gold. Whenever I found myself in the desert or anywhere with a strong sun, I would think I could be happy here. Because I wanted to persist, persist, I told myself I could grow anywhere. Because so many rainy days I thirsted for the sun to plump me, I dreamed sun. I dreamed sun. But always there was a thin thread that held me in place. I thought it meant loosely attached. I thought it meant not rooted. But lately I've learned to keep low to my own boundary layer something about growing into a place. How slowly I saw my own simplicity. I never desired an ambitious flowering. I don't compete well. Now, when I come home from far away, the air tastes wet on my body. I open my palms to funnel the rain, permeable to home, loyal to this land. It means I don't transplant plant well. I know this now. And the final poem that I'm going to read is also not in your journal, um, but is, I think, um, a great poem to end on, especially for a cold, rainy day like today. <laughs> More rain. Rain. <laughs> Her name is Rain. Ancient and drumming, she's like a god, and aren't we her submissive? And when I am separated, I wonder what she's doing to the trees and if the mud misses my feet. I wonder if she's sad that I'm not there to catch her, and I am afraid of her absence and startled when skies are so clear, stars single me out. And what I think I am trying to say is that rain is a being. I want to make a case for rain as a being. I know some think of rain as something that just happens or a minor annoyance ruining an opportune moment. And some think of rain only when the air sparks and they taste ash. But listen, rain is living in relationship with all other beings, biomes, 
fungi and foxes and human like you right now are in a private relationship with rain, adapted, modified, amended, and customized to her existence. Imagine rain unsinking from soil, withdrawing her botanical breath or gray scent of wet rock, falling back up mountains and unrushing from the sky. Imagine after the only sound is the grit of salt stirring into dust and you smell rain in your sleep like someone you once knew and in your dreams you carry notes you collage by blues and grays from memory. If to be a being is to be alive, which is to have some quality that distinguishes a vital and functional being from death, then tell me if her absence is our absence. When she comes, will you call her by her name? talk about writing process or inspiration or anything. Um, the, no, that's really loud. <laughs> uh, the question I have is um, how, how much does a poem change for you from the first draft to, to the last draft? Oh, good question. Um, it really depends. Some, there's a very rare poem that just comes out. That, that's, I think that's happened like two or three times. <laughs> um, but for the most part, there's, there's a lot of revision. I have one poem that I'm working on that I think has probably like 60 drafts on it and it's still not done. And it'll probably, <laughs> like Elise was saying, it'll probably be years <laughs> before it's done. <laughs> so it just really depends. Um, and I don't really have any, yeah, you just, you just kind of know. Goodness, cheese. Uh, is there, a, like thinking of your process, is there a typical way or place that your poems begin? Like, do you have certain times of day that you say these are my writing times? Is there a certain place where you compose? Do you start by hand? Um, is there sort of some common thread in terms of how you get into that mode? Yeah, so all the things. Um, <laughs> um, I, I write best away from home. Um, I'm very distracted by dishes and to-do lists. So um, it's best for me to, I, I, like shout out to Copa, I go there Monday through Friday. <laughs> um, and also for me, it's best to just habit. I go pretty much every morning, I get up early, and it's a place where I don't allow myself to check email, it's, I'm, it's work. Um, so finding a, like a habitual time and space, um, I usually draft by hand and then move to a computer for revision. How poems come to me, it's just, it's so random. I mean, like the, the in utero came from a fresh air interview. Um, sometimes I'm just musing on a topic and a line will come to me and then it somehow makes a whole poem. Um, so it can kind of be anything. <laughs> so if you're in a coffee shop can be noisy. Yeah. Do you Tune into that, tune out, do you have headphones? No, for some reason it's so easy for me, when there's a lot of noise, it's so easy for me to, to be completely, I just don't notice it at all. But in my own home, when it's quiet, I'm like completely distracted by everything else. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, I w was hoping uh, you could speak about finding your voice and trying to navigate between drawing inspiration while um, also trying to identify what your own unique perspective is and trying to figure and untangle that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, kind of what Elise was saying about, um, T.S. Eliot wrote a, has a line, I think it was T.S. Eliot, good poets imitate and great poets steal. 
<laughs> and um, I, it's okay, I think, to like copy and if like if there's other poets that really resonate with you and your writing is similar to their voice, that's great. Eventually you will find your own. And it really just comes from um, practice and also reading out loud. When you're writing a, writing a poem, reading out loud to yourself will help you find your own rhythm for how you speak um, and your cadence. So I hope that helps, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have a question um, about organization, especially, you know, when you like know you wrote this great poem and there's like 20 or 30 drafts. Do you save them all? Do you retitle them? How do you ever find them again in your laptop? I mean, I really have a problem with this, but um, it could be because I'm not digitally native. <laughs> but, you know, any, any pointers on organization? Yeah. Um, I keep one Word document, and when I'm getting ready to start revising a poem, I copy it from the previous version, start a new page, and work from there. So I just have one word document for that poem. Um, and I date it. So I always have the date at the top of the page, start the poem, and then the next day. And you save all the drafts so that- It's just one word document with every version. Oh, continuous yeah. on the page. Yeah. So like that one poem that, that I was talking about that's like 60, it's, it's probably like 100 pages because it's, it's a long poem. And then um, I don't know if you have a Mac. I, I think you can do this in, um, on a PC as well. But I also organize, like you can put a little dot next to, um, like a colored dot next to. So like the, for me, green means that it's been published. Red means that it's like finished, complete. And then I have like yellow and orange that are like different stages of progress. So you can kind of organize that way too in your, your files. Oh, are we good? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Misty. Okay, so um, we just wanted to give some final thank yous. Um, a huge thank you to Elise and Misty for doing this edition. Can we get a little clap? Okay. And we'd also like to thank AK Litho for the fantastic design and printing work. Um, thank you to Chancellor Palmer, Provost Havig, and Dean of Art and Sciences, Karen Silkaitis. The journal would not have been a success without their immense support. Um, we'd also like to thank Amy Bannerman, Beverly Keefe, Susie Vollmer, Dallas Cascuela for their administrative support, Gloria Mary, Cody Bennett, Katie Jordan, my amazing writing, writing center boss, Jesse Goodman, who is sitting right there. Um, <laughs> uh, Jonas Lamb, uh, Sean McCarthy, and Haley Reed for the launch promotion and website development. So here's Sienna with the rest. Um, so then, if we could get everyone in the room who has been published to stand. Yes, published in the 2024 edition. So. Thank you all so much. Make sure to pick up a copy so that you can see all their amazing work. And then we also want to thank our Title Echoes editorial board. So if you're in the room, please stand as well. Um, Brian Palmer, Math Trafton, Rosemary Alexander, Jeff Kirsch, Jonas Lamb, Ida Heatherberg, and Emily Wall. So then I know we could only accept cash, but <laughs> if you didn't have any or want to buy additional copies um, and you're in Juno, the Juno Douglas Museum, Juno Arts and Humanities Center, Hearthside Books, Rainy Retreat, Alaska Robotics, and Kindred Post um, have our journal. And Kindred Post is also doing online orders. So if you want to ship out of state or anything like that. Um, if you're in Sitka, Old Harbor Books, Skagway, Skagway News Depot and Books, Ketchikan, Parnison Bookstore. And then, yeah, thank, ev 
Thank you all for attending. And then thank you, Emily Wall, again. This journal does not work without you.